You have tired me, oh my soul. It's important that people raise this. Seamus O'Kelly was uh, born just up the street from where we're talking here uh, over a hundred years ago and he was kind of forgotten. But because of a couple of people and Maria, very important, putting it up there that this guy was a celebrated writer in his time and he should be celebrated again and remembered and not lost to history. And doing things like that, like attaching his name to our local drama group, that's a small thing. But people know Seamus O'Kelly and people will actually say, who's Seamus O'Kelly? We go around to different areas uh, bringing our plays on drama festivals or something. They'll actually ask who Seamus O'Kelly is. And Manny in the group will actually turn around and people will drop off and say, oh yeah, Seamus came from Lockray. If you did that a couple of years ago, nobody would have an idea. Seamus, as we know, is normally spelled S-E-A-M-U-S, with the father on the first D. But he spelt it S-E-U-M-A-S. A cry comes in the wind be times the stars are broken sleep. A poor coob in the harler stole but now she doesn't weep. Our pax is getting old, so old she never counts the days. And people going by her door don't understand the ways. But long and long ago she tell that a child she oak took. The little branch the horlers came one seven night to pluck. A band of pipers from the hill came down the windy night. And the music strange made at her door and seen the human sight. It's really what you find in life if you observe people and if you don't uh, project your own expectations onto people. And the same with the landscape. If you walk the landscape slowly, you you see these things. And he, he just had a great eye. That would have been him because even as a child, he couldn't run fast. There's a spellbinding quality to the writing and there's so much... Um, what can I say? There's so much subtlety and so much kind of almost um, secretiveness and see more in it each time you read it and you anticipate certain twists or certain passages, you know, you're, you're looking forward to reading them and then suddenly you see something else that you hadn't noticed before. Nobody is a stereotype in his stories. Like, no matter who they are, you're spellbound by the story anyway and suddenly... There's a comical bit that is so funny and it's so suddenly funny that you'll burst out laughing no matter where you are. I think it's just full of fun. Well, his, um, the homeliness about him, like his, his, his deep feelings about and down, really down to earth. At the time, you know, I thought it was a bit monotonous. You know, but... <laughs> <laughs> the innocence of youth. <laughs> Mary, she bore Jesus, who died on the cross. And Mary, she bore Jesus, our Saviour for to be. And the first tree that's in the greenwood, it was the holly, holly, holly. And the first tree that's in the greenwood, it was the holly. Oh, the holly, she bears a berry as black as coal. And Mary, she bore Jesus, who died for us all. And Mary, she bore Jesus, our Saviour for to be. And the first tree that's in the greenwood, it was the holly. Holly, holly. And the first tree that's in the greenwood. Here at the Weaver's Grave which is set here, right here in Gary Breda, um, which is called the, the Garden or the Field of St. Bridget. And we're standing inside a very old, the old remains of an old church. And um, I just have the book here, so I'm just going to read a little bit. Yeah. To glance at Clun and Marav as you went by on the hilly road was to get an impression of a very old burial ground. To pause on the road and look at Clunamarv was to become conscious, conscious of its quiet situation, of winds singing down from the hills in a chant for the dead. To walk over to the wall and look at the mounds inside 
was to provoke quotations from Gray's elegy. To make the sign of the cross, lean over the wall, observe the gloomy, lightened background of the wall opposite and mark the things that seemed to stray about like yellow snakes in the grass. Was to think of Hamlet moralising at the graveside of Ophelia and hear him establish the identity of Yorick. He's such an engaging writer and the, the man is describing the afterlife in a dream and it's what you imagine and it's memory and it, it's him trying to come to terms with death and it's just magnificent isn't it? It is, it is, yeah, and reality and all the doubts that we have are what's real and what isn't. But that's okay. why it's translated into so many different languages. It's been translated into Russian, Japanese, Chinese, uh, French, Italian, Spanish. And it's studied in, in universities abroad, but I've never heard of him. I had never heard of him until I came across this in a bookshop in Middle Abbey Street. Just, um, so it's been a real odyssey discovering yeah. his other and works, it, 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 it like The Lady of Deer Park. Yeah. Another, and this has been um, reissued in America by uh, Turtle Point Press. They reprint books that are out of, um, out of copyright. And uh, Dublin Libraries bought this in a few years ago, so now I think there's two copies in most branches of Dublin Libraries, and it's just brilliant. Yeah. So um, I think it'd be nice to see other other works of his back in in print and people Absolutely. accessing them. You know. Yeah. So we're, we've made this trip to Loch Ray now to discover some uh, places associated with Seamus O'Kelly because this is his birthplace. This is where he was born. So not only are we going to the Weaver's grave, which we're standing in now, we're going to go to different spots from his literary life yes and we're going to meet an old man in the town uh who knows the most that's right yeah. about Seamus O'Kelly a wonderful man called Norman Morgan of Loch Ray. he's a printer he printed he reprinted um runs and ballads and he also which is the lovely ballads and uh they're very poetic that you yourself have recorded Sean he has a great collection of Seamus O'Kelly books and plays and everything to do with Seamus O'Kelly. He's a wonderful erudite man who appreciates great literature and he's done wonderful things for Loch Ray. He was a counsellor there at one stage. So, and it's still being used today. So. This is a printer or something, isn't it? Yeah, Norman is a printer and his son now carries on the business and his son is also called Norman. <coughs> yeah, sorry, I'm yeah, no. <laughs> that must have just seems so stupid. No, you're not. After you saying all of that, <laughs> and I'm just going, what is that printers? Are you still recording? Is that one of those papers? Do you edit this? <laughs> no, yeah. no, you can edit it all. Yeah. Like, you know, sure. Oh, great, yeah. This, oh, this really is good. just to give you something, which I might have given them to you before. Yes, oh, lovely, oh, fantastic. Oh, they're beautiful, yeah. Uh, they're, they're not really. They are, so, just, yeah, uh, this is Seamus O'Kelly. This is from the portrait by Estella Solomons yeah. that was painted often just in 1917, just a year before he died. So this yeah. is one of the great stories. The Grey Lake. Yes. Yeah. And what's this story about? Well, by the look of the uh, town of the Grey Lake. You know. That's right, yeah. So if... Uh, so we call it, uh, in, in, in Irish, like, by the Loch yes. town of the Grey Lake. And the, the lake, um, is there some kind of a legend about the lake? Um, I wouldn't think there is a legend as such, but he wrote his story about the Grey Lake, which he makes up something that's um, exciting or something like that, you know. Yes. The but there is nothing special about it. Is it not supposed to be a town buried underneath the lake or drowned, a drowned town? Yes, but I w that, that couldn't have been so. Could it not? No. There's just a hollow in the, in the, in the earth at that particular place where the, where the water is. Right. Where the lake is and yeah. so on. The same, as, the same as any other lake, you know. Oh, okay. Because there's no water flowing into it. Right. It's only the rainwater that lands on the land and especially from the mountains in the background and flow into the lake. And the lake itself as well uh, has a lot of springs in it. 
Now, if one were out swimming and that kind of thing, you'd feel the cold water uh, as you're going through the water, swimming along, you know. That it's not the same all the way you'd, you'd notice that there were springs in various places. But sure, there must be dozens of those springs yeah. where the water is coming up from underground. Yeah, and that's what the story is about. It's about all these springs, isn't it? The seven springs. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And there is no river, that's right. And um, were you born in Loch Ray yourself, Norman? Uh, no, I was born in hospital. Right. So that, that would be, be being in Galway. Okay. Yeah. But you were brought up here. Oh yes, Ray. this is. And and how did you hear of Seamus O'Kelly? Huh? How did you hear of? How did you know about Seamus O'Kelly? Well, for everybody who would live in Loch Ray, this is all passed down, like. Yes. When I was in school, we'd never heard of him. Yeah. And ne next to we did hear about his play, the we we were playing being translated into a radio and winning some award in I think Italy, Italian radio or something. So, but now I'd moved to Dublin at that stage when I started to hear this. It's a dream Mortimer Hatter was, and his loom, and his shuttles, and his warping bars, and his banning, and the threads that he put upon the shifting racks were all a dream. And the only thing he ever wove upon his loom was a dream. The old man smacked his lips, his hard gums whacking. His daughter looked at him with her head a little to one side. And what's more, said the cooper, every woman that ever came into his head and every wife he married was a dream. I'm telling you that, man. And I'm telling to you of the weaver. His life is a dream. And his death is a dream. And the widow there is a dream. And all the world is a dream. Do you hear me, Nan? The world's all a dream. I hear you very well, father, the daughter sang in a piercing voice. The cooper raised his head with a jerk, and his beard swept forward, giving him an appearance of vivid energy. He spoke in a voice like a trumpet blast. And I am a dream! And he turned his blue eyes in the window, an unnerving sensation came to her. The cooper was the most dreadful old man she had ever seen. And what he was saying sounded the most terrible thing she had ever listened to. He cried. The idiot laughing in the street, the king looking at his crown, the women turning her head to the sound of a man's step, the bells ringing in the belfry, a man walking, his land, the weaver at his loom, the cooper handling his barrel, the pope stooping for, for his red slippers, they're all a dream. And I'll tell you why they're a dream. Because this world was meant to be a dream. The way it's going to work as the film is going to be... It's kind of like a dream sequence. Pardon? The film would be somewhat like a dream. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's like we're looking for Shames Academy. We wanted to feel like a dream. Oh, yeah. Because that's yeah. A, one of the main forms of entertainment that's still accessible to people at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only new media coming out is people's own dreams. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's no the many yeah. programs being made, so people are just dreaming. That's the best yeah. they can do. Yeah. Controlled their finances in his little black book. He used. Mm. And at one stage, I reckon he was going around, this book was carrying about 10% of the gross national product of Argentina. Mm. That's what that man said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they were very wealthy. I was there two years ago, and the 700 children came out of the school in the evening wearing grey snacks and a white t shirt with green writing, I Fahi. He speaks the Midlands accent. You'd never think he was uh, from Argentina at all. But they, had they, had speak, they had hurling clubs out there. They had 11 hurling teams in Buenos Aires yeah. at one stage. Yeah. And they were active right up to the Second World War. Yeah. It was round in the front of the to get hurls. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember he telling me when he met Castro, they sat down at a table planning the Pope's visit. And they had an interpreter. And Castro said to him after he realised after a while, yeah, he was so good in Spanish, that he didn't need an interpreter. And Castro got rid of the interpreter, A.E. Child. And Child, together with Sarah Purser, set up on Thor Glenna, the <laughs> Tower of Glass in Dublin. And there, that was the beginning of the Irish stained glass industry. I think it was on Pembroke Street, I think, in Dublin. And they supplied the windows here. You got to like Lock Ray so much. He moved down to Liverpool. Okay, all yeah. right, all right. He, was, he was living above in Killiney. Yeah. And then he rented an old school outside town. 22 years ago. We were in Lock Ray. And how did you recognise him? He started his workshop. 
She had to mask on. Yeah, yeah. Her eyes are. She said. She said something about. Dark hair. She knows something about me. And then go back to the weekend. And then she said something about. And she said, "Oh, I'm not from here. I came here from Ireland." But they, they have a studio. They got <laughs> 22 years ago. <laughs> and as I say, I think we got down from Lochter to Galway in about oh, okay. half an hour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Their heart was in my mouth, and I was thinking, well, at least this is making me feel good. But she made a great conversation all the way down. Yeah, yeah. 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 you know. Oh, it's an interesting place around here. The cathedral grounds here and the cathedral itself. Yeah. When you didn't have radios and television and all the rest of it, and there was more mixing of people would go into one another's houses and in their turn, you know. Uh, so they were more in touch. Yeah. Now it's the mobile and all the rest of it. Yeah. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nowadays, there's a modern or a postmodern idea that uh, human beings are somehow the enemy of nature. Well, I would believe that we are nature. We are, um, we're made from the same components and the same minerals and the same proteins as uh, all of nature around us. And, um, you know, that uh, it's, uh, it's the instinct of humans is to plant and dig. And you even see small children, you put them in, out in the garden, the next thing they start digging and lifting up stones and all that, and you know, making little piles of stones. And when you're out in the elements, you see how the clouds change so often and the the sounds of nature the sounds of the raindrops on the leaves and the rustling of the the branches in in winter it's like bare twigs rubbing off each other in summer it's a real rustly shushy kind of sound because their memory is the thing their data or whatever yeah what's in their head what's like? in their heads is the is the treasure that's right is yeah. that's what they're in search of in the book maybe that's a bit a vague way of saying it but it's funny how this uh, trip is kind of a little bit like replicant of the it's a bit it's similar yeah, to it's the original story you know we're in search of shame with so kelly yeah and there we have a little fella with an, an orange hat over there <laughs> the older residents of Kilmeen i always reckon that the, sh the leprechaun is still seen out there now and again and what's so special about the lake Oh, sure. I, I don't know. Sure, everything is unique and special. That's true. D how important uh, do you think you are? Me? Yeah. I suppose just as important as anyone else. Yeah. You're more important than the earth, the sun, the moon and the stars. They're all just floating in space. They don't even know they exist. He created those things and he also created you. But look what he's given to you. And these other things are just floating in space and mindless. I suppose, yeah. So now... It's all dreamlike and trance-like and you're kind of wondering at the end of it. Did that happen or did it happen or what happened, you know? It's wonderful.